Hello, I greet you and I greet you in the presence, in the very presence of the Most Holy Trinity, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How many times we have said in our lives that time flies, time flies when we get old especially, we can understand that more. Time flies month after month, year after year, and we grow without being conscious of it. Now, the question we need to ask is, are we wasting our time, because that is important, that we grow by time, it's a fact. We can't deny it and we can't stop it. But the, the problem is, are we wasting our time or are we making good use, as God wants us to do, with the time he is giving us? So, whether we are wasting it or not depends on one thing only. That is, whether we are using time to grow in our love for God and for our neighbor, for the love of God. That is important as well. Eh? We love our neighbor for the love of God, not for other interests. We love our neighbor. God wants us to love our neighbor for his love. <clears throat> Blessed are those who are growing daily in their love of God. We can all grow and love God more and more. No one is excluded. God does not exclude anyone for no reason whatsoever. Until we are here on earth, alive, then the exclusions would be after that. Those who stubbornly refuse to accept God. Now, here on earth, no one is excluded. But it often happens that we think of everything except of God and our relationship with Him. How is our relationship with God? If God were to call us at this very moment now, what would we say? Where would we go? The devil does everything to turn us away from God and to prevent us from thinking of God and of his will for us. That is important. I mean, we think of God, but we think of God's will for us as well. Both together, thinking of God without neglecting what God wants of us. That would be stupid and negligent. That is important, so. Eventually, we end up having time for everything except for God. The devil, as I said, the devil does everything to turn us away from God and prevent us from thinking of God. When we love God with perfect love, we think of God continuously. You say, Mark, how is it possible to think of God continuously? It is possible because you are living every second of your life and you want to please God every second of your life. So God's presence before you is every second of your life. If you go shopping, I go shopping because God wants me to go shopping. So I go, I do it well for his glory, for his love. Every item, whatever I do, if I am entertaining myself, if I am studying, if I am working, if I am going for a walk and somehow I'm meeting friends and so on. That's why every second of my life I shall be doing God's will for his glory. So God is always present before me all the time. When we love God with perfect love, we think of God continuously. Whatever we do, we do it because it's his will for us. We do it for his love and glory. We end up with having no time, which is not for God. 
we end up with having no time which is not for God. Every second is for him. We do everything for his love. Right. That is important so that we do everything for the love of God and because God wants us to do it. If we want to love God with perfect love, we must do God's will always, even in small things. Now, this is another problem, because you might be tempted by the devil that if there is some great project, some great thing, whatever, eh, we enter and do our part to take part and to help. And in little things, in small things, you say, well, oh, these are insignificant things which are God's will for us as well. Before God, there, is not, there are no small or big things. Everything is big, everything is great. Even this least will of his for us is great before God. So, God sees the intensity with which we do his will. Thus, a small work with great love has more value before God than a great work with little love. Jesus told us that whoever does the will of God also in small things will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So, if we want to love God with perfect love, we must do God's will for us, both in big things and in small things. It is easy to convince ourselves that if there is a great work so, of charity to be done, that somehow it will be beneficial to our neighbor, where people see us, we will embark upon it wholeheartedly. But then, if we have a small opportunity to do some good, some good to our neighbor, which will be somehow hidden to the public, then we refuse to do it. For the simple reason that no one is seeing us. That's why I insisted that we love God and we love our neighbor for the love of God. Another problem that can come across in our love for God, because we encounter problems as well when we try to love God with perfect love, another problem is the possibility of not seeing the fruit of our works. Whether the work we have done is material or even spiritual. For example, we pray for our children, for our husband or wife, for anyone else, whoever it is. And we don't see any positive results. If we love God with perfect love, we shall not give up our prayers. Why? Because when we are praying for someone, without seeing a result, we are doing God's will. We leave the result in God's hands. God is not going to ask us, what, is, what result have you got for your works? No, God will ask us, have you done my will independently of the result? We do our part so for the glory of God, to please God, and then we leave the result in his hands. He knows when the result we are asking for will be. He knows. Perhaps we are praying now and the result will come about in 30, 40 years hence. It's in, it's in God's hands. Also in this matter, so the devil can easily deceive us to discourage us, of course, that's the purpose, to discourage us from continuing to fulfill God's will for us because we are not seeing any results. If we feel demoralized, I come across people, 
sometimes those who come and speak to me. If we feel demoralized, it is not a good sign. Demoralization is not a virtue. Demoralization is not a virtue. It is not a good sign. It's not a sign of our love for God. Because feeling demoralized is pride. We are proud when we feel demoralized. We need to keep before our eyes that we are doing God's will and that's enough even if we don't see any fruit of what we do. We please God by doing his will and not by the fruits of our work. The fruits of our work will come from God. Therefore, if we see the fruit of our work, because I am not saying that we never see the fruits of our work, whatever it is, material or spiritual, sometimes we see the fruits, but not always. And this is where the devil tries to deceive us, when we don't see the fruit of what we are doing. But still so. I am insisting that what is important for us to love God with perfect love and to do his will. Now, in case we see the fruits of his love, of our, of our work, we thank him, we thank God, because all good comes from God. And you know that God can give us good directly. And he can give us good even through some misfortune, some sacrifice, some suffering, some disease. God knows how to draw good out of evil. So we leave him dead in his hands. We do our part, God's will for us, and God, God will surely do his part. But the way he knows how, not the way we want him to do it. So let's do God's will for us. Let's do it the way God wants us to do it. Let's do it with great love, with our heart constantly, burning with great love for him. Whoever has any difficulty with what I am saying can ask me. I always answer your questions as clearly as possible and according to your needs. You can also share your opinion on what I am saying. We can learn much from each other and grow in our perfect love of God together. You can also pose the prayer you like most, even if invented by yourself. Everyone knows how to pose the message on this video or in any other video of mine. Now I shall speak on St. John Bosco. I have called today's video St. John Bosco and Paul Lamarche. So, St. John Bosco, you know about him, and a French man, Paul, it's written as in English, P-A-U-L, but as you know in English we say Paul, in French we read it Paul, Paul, not Paul. His surname is Lamarche, I can spell it for you, L-A-M-A-C-H-E, L-A-L-A. -E. L -A -L -A. M-A-C-H-E, Mash, the final E is mute, we don't pronounce it. So his surname is Paul, his, so his name is Paul, his surname is Lamash. On the 38, 13th of May, 13th of May, 1886, we, have, we didn't have it in that year yet the first apparition of Our Lady of Fatima, because as you know, Our Lady in Fatima appeared on the 13th of the, each month, 13th, and 13th of May was the first apparition. We are in 1886, 1886. But we had already the apparition at Lourdes. So, on the 13th of May, 1886, 
Saint John Bosco was in Grenoble. Grenoble is a big, very beautiful, famous city in France. In France. So Don Bosco was in Grenoble. He went to different countries and to different, to different countries as well, and to different cities as well in France. In France, as usual, Don Bosco had a very, very busy day. In the morning, he celebrated mass in the cathedral of Grenoble, with the participation of the chapter of the cathedral. During the mass. Saint John Bosco gave a long sermon to the congregation gathered in the cathedral. In this sermon, he spoke about the Salesian works. The Salesians had a number of works, missions. In Italian, they called them Le Opere Salesiane, eh? mission, Salesian works. And Saint John Bosco did not mention just the works that the Salesians were doing, but also how good these works were and how suitable these goods were to the times or to the needs of those times. You know that even the Church, from time to time, changes its methods, its ways of doing things, according to the times. And Don Bosco did it as well. Don Bosco did it as well. From time to time changed. As a matter of fact, even today the Salesians, basically they are working, they are doing the same work, but the methods used have changed according to the times. Afterwards, after so Don Bosco spoke about the work of the Salesians, and the way they are doing that work, there was a collection so among the congregation there in the cathedral. So that those hundreds of people who were gathered in the cathedral could help Don Bosco as much as they could in the great expenses he had. After Mass, Saint John Bosco left the cathedral and crossed the Grenoble Square which was full of people, I could say, choked with people, and started walking towards the presbytery. The presbytery, as you know, is the house where the parish priest lives. At one point, an old man with white hair crossed the crowd and arrived in front of Don Bosco. Why Don Bosco was walking, towards the presbytery. This man fell on his knees before him, before Don Bosco, and asked him to bless him, as usual, with the blessing of Mary, help of Christians, and to pray for his wife. His wife was seriously ill, she was dying. So he asked Don Bosco to bless him and to pray for his wife, all the people of Grenoble knew that old man and had great respect for him. This was Paul Lamash. Paul Lamash, the one I mentioned right at the start when I gave you the title of the video. Who was Paul Lamash? Paul Lamash was one of the seven men who, together with Ozanam, I am sure you have heard about Ozanam. So Paul Lamash was one of the seven men who, along with Ozanam, had founded in Paris in 1833, 1833, the Society of Saint Vincent de Paul, better known as the Conferences of Saint Vincent de Paul. Now, at that time, when Don Bosco was in Grenoble, Paul Lamache was an old man and he had gone to live in Grenoble before he lived in some other city in France. But while Don Bosco was in Grenoble, he happened to be living there as well. And just when Saint John Bosco was in Grenoble, 
his wife was seriously ill. She was eating almost nothing. She had lost, she had lost all appetite. Eh? She, she was suffering from loss of appetite, which is very serious. Because of that, the doctors had given up their hope of her ever continuing to live. But Paul Lamarche was a man of great faith. He knew who St. John Bosco was. Therefore, he made his last effort to heal his wife by asking Don Bosco to pray for her. And St. John Bosco, after hearing him talk about his wife's grave condition, it was serious condition, she was dying, stopped for a while, consulted the Most Holy Trinity, and then said to him, do an act, an act of charity to help those in need in such a way that this act will cause you some sacrifice. So this is what Don Bosco asked him. Paul Lamarche asked Don Bosco to pray for his wife to heal miraculously. And Don Bosco is telling him, okay, but do some sacrifice. Do some do some charity, an act of charity, but do a type of charity that you feel it, that you are feeling the sacrifice of that charity, because sometimes we make, we give arms, say, or give, but for us, they would be as we, when we say peanuts, just nothing. Eh? No, most of them make an act of charity in such a way that you feel the sacrifice of that act. And then Don Bosco continued, of course, inspired by God, because he didn't know the family of Paul Lamash. And don't, don't your daughters, don't your daughters have a lot of family jewels and are greatly attached to them. Yes, they have many jewels, Paul Lamarche answered. And Don Bosco said to him, tell them to offer these jewels to many help of Christians for the needs of the Salesian works. In what St. John Bosco asked them, both Paul Lamarche and his daughters had to make a very hard and great sacrifice because they would end up completely detached from the jewels they possessed and all these jewels ended up at the Salesian Oratory in Valdocco, Turin. When he saw that they had made that sacrifice, Don Bosco sent a telegram to Paul Lamarche saying, the healing of your wife will surely happen if it is good for the salvation of her soul. As a matter of fact, Madame Lamarche was miraculously healed and continued to live for another 20 years. You who are listening and me one day in heaven together shall be, always by the power of God's grace.